It's really good to see everyone this evening. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, stand up here before you and, and welcome everyone, especially being able to see everyone at the same time. A lot of people smiling back at me. Some people not. So, okay, there we go. Uh, no, it's great to be with, with Christians this evening, uh, ready to worship and ready to uh, increase in our knowledge and our unified spirit here at, at Kirkland. Would you bow with me at this time? Our Father in heaven, we're, we humbly approach you in prayer, thankful for this hour to spend together once again this day of the Lord's Day. We pray that our worship this evening would be beneficial to each and every one of us. We know that we have uh, work to do in this upcoming week to reach out to others, to spread your gospel, and to affect our community. We pray for help. We pray for courage in that regard so that we would be found faithful as, as your servants. We're thankful for everyone that's here. We pray that you would be with us through this worship, that everything that is said and that is done and the songs that are sung would be from our hearts, that would be right and acceptable uh, to you. Thank you for the work that's happening here at Kirkland. We thank you for the leaders that are guiding us to work more together each and every day to be unified and to face forward and approach uh, the world and, and, and as one and working together as one in this uh, church here. We pray that you would forgive us of the things that we've done wrong, that we would consider uh, our ways and correct those things that are not in keeping with your will for us. We pray your forgiveness for those things. Go with us now as we enter into this worship and we pray for those that are not with us for whatever reason. So pray your special blessing upon the, them if they're ill or in need of your care. And this we pray in your son Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Is there anyone here tonight that needs to partake of the Lord's Supper? There is, and there are. And so uh, if you raise your hand high, and one of our deacons will help you with uh, a cup at this time, so we can have that taken care of when we get to the Lord's Supper. So we're really happy that you're here tonight. Uh, tonight we have Ben preaching for us from God's Word, and we look forward to that. Um, we're just really appreciative of all of you here tonight that decided to worship God and make that a priority and assemble and be together and have fellowship and to encourage one another. So uh, we're going to sing two songs uh, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper, uh, two songs that are uh, looking towards heaven, uh, the idea of looking towards where we're supposed to be going and where we're looking forward to be going. Uh, the first one is How Long Till the Morning. This is a song we've learned in the past, and uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse 17, 18 says, We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. So how long to the morning? Do ti la do consider Oh, 
please stand with me as we sing Mansions Over the Hilltop. We'll sing a newer song, we'll sing a, an older hymn, Mansions Over the, Over the Hilltop. One of my favorite verses, Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. And uh, he goes to prepare a place for us, and he has a place prepared for us. So after the song, uh, we will partake of the Lord's Supper. We'll sing. There's two verses of this song, and we'll sing both. Domine, I'm satisfied with the times we As a reminder, again, we still have the little cups and packets if you're needing one. Um, I'm going to be reading out of Zechariah tonight, the ninth chapter of Zechariah, focusing on verses 9 through 11. So just a couple of verses there. But just to set the scene, this is the, this is the prophecy that we read about when Jesus is doing his triumphal entry as he's riding on the, the donkey, on the, the colt that had never been ridden before. This is where that prophecy is coming from. And God doesn't just provide that for us just so he can say, see, Jesus fulfilled this one prophecy in time. But I just kind of wanted to draw our minds back to what was the promise here in Zechariah to the people of Israel and also to the nations around um, at this point. So here at the, in the beginning of Zechariah 9, we, Zechariah is talking about a judgment that's going to come upon all the nations, all the enemies of Israel at this time. But from all of those enemies, God is going to take a remnant. And it says there in verses 7, he says, I shall take a remnant from you, and it shall be like a clan of Judah. So even from all these nations, he's providing a promise to all of us who are not of the tribe of, of Israel, of the tribes of Israel, that there's going to be a remnant of us that are going to be invited into the kingdom. And then now the promise here that Jesus is fulfilling by riding on the donkey, Zechariah writes, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariots from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. So here, God is providing the prophecy that not just those of the tribe of Israel will be invited into his family, but the tribes of the nations, and that in his time, God will provide judgment upon them. But he will have another covenant that's going to come that will um, bring his righteousness and his salvation and, and 
um, enthrone Jesus, his Savior, on the throne. So I just kind of wanted to bring that to our mind as we remember the great king that we serve as we're remembering his sacrifice. Our wonderful and holy Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your awesome glory. Lord, we know that you are the one and only holy God that is in this existence that we are in. Lord, we thank you so much for creating us to be like you in your image. We thank you so much for having the love for us that you wanted this relationship, that you have called us out of many nations to be a part of your one family. We thank you so much for your son Jesus, for his love and his dedication, his obedience to you, and the death that he went to that cross for us to die for our sins. And we pray that you'll be with those that partake of the bread at this time, that they'll remember that the bread represents his body that was shared for us, that was shed for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. have a prayer for the cup. Again, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love, for the, the offering of your Son's blood that was perfect for our sins that um, have corrupted us before you. But we thank you so much that our sins can be washed away because of this blood, because of this covenant that you have established with us that is fulfilled by your promises and by your word. But we thank you so much for the power that this blood has sweeping backwards and forwards throughout time to cover all those who would call upon your name and declare themselves as part of your family through obedience. But we thank you so much for this ability that we have to remember your son's sacrifice every week, to keep it in our minds so that we know how much you love us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. got a lot of idioms and sayings that we like for uh, growth. We talk about, you know, it doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. We'll say, uh, you know, nothing easy is worth doing. Um, there's, there's a lot that we, that we say about how, you know, no pain, no gain, all these kind of sayings. And there's a grain of truth in it, right? Even in our faith, there is truth in this idea that growth or maturity can't come without some amount, whether great or small, of pain and suffering and, and loss and um, all these things that are both hard to articulate and topics that we don't necessarily enjoy talking about. I've had Romans on the brain uh, for obvious reasons. We've been, I've been inundated with it for the past few months now, and I've been really enjoying our Sunday morning study and the Thursday night classes we've had, and uh, I just can't seem to, no matter how much I try to preach on other things, Romans kind of comes to the front of my mind. And so if I preach too much about Romans, I apologize. Um, but I think, you know, it's just there's so much in it that I, you know, it's worth looking more at these things. So this is, we're going to look at these verses, uh, these verses we looked at next week on Sunday morning, but let's start here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. I want you to look at these verses and think about this idea. You know, we, we started talking about this, this section this morning, this idea about the, the Holy Spirit being led by the Spirit. That's where right where this picks up in Romans eight fourteen. It says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. See, this, these verses sound so great, and they are. This chapter of Romans is one of the most beautiful and most hopeful sections of the whole New Testament, honestly, in my estimation. 
And it goes on to some of the most beautiful language about what could separate us from the love of Christ, neither height nor depth, and all these things. And he goes through this beautiful uh, hymn, it seems like, almost poetry, just these beautiful words of encouragement to Christians saying, look, there's nothing that will ever separate us from God's love, from Jesus Christ, from having God's Holy Spirit within us. And it starts with these ideas. You know, if we're being led by the Spirit of God, we are sons of God. You know, sometimes I think uh, people, maybe particularly in our culture today, chafe at the language of sons of God because it's a gender-exclusive term. But one of the things you have to think about in the time it was written is that sons were the only ones that got inheritance. So I don't think there's this idea in here. It's not a, there are not perfect pictures, but there are pictures that were given at the time. And if you think about this, part of the reason the New Testament uses the word sons and not sons and daughters is because a huge part of the promises that we get through Christ our inheritance is our inheritance. And so you, you might still chafe at it. I don't know, maybe that's not a good enough explanation for you. But I, just, I wanted to point that out because sometimes I think we don't think about these things. And it's helpful to know that part of the reason that this word sons is used so much is because with it came this understanding that if we're God's sons in that time, then we're going to get some of what he's, what he's going to pass on. We're going to get some of the inheritance. And this is a huge part of this, that we get, we are fellow heirs with Christ. Just let's think about that idea for a moment. The only one who ever lived a perfect life, the only son of God who came down by his own volition, didn't have to, didn't need to, but desired to for our sake, lived a perfect life and died an unrighteous death for us so that we could be counted in some ways equal to him. Not that we will, he is our Lord, he is above us, but he did that so that we would be counted among his brethren, that we would get an inheritance just like him. That is the idea. That is the ideal of this passage. But look at the, at the cost in some senses. Look at this no pain, no gain, nothing easy is worth doing idea in this. And, and in the middle of this, you can almost miss it. It says, we are fellow heirs of, with Christ if indeed we suffer with him. What do you think about that? You know, in a lot of these discussions, and just in a lot of Christian discussions, we talked about the rich young ruler a few weeks ago, and we read stories like that, and, and the common question is, does God expect me to sell all my possessions? And if not, then where on the scale, the sliding scale of that, do I fall? Like, do I need to sell some of my possessions? Do I need to give more? Am I not giving enough? Like, how do I interact with this idea? And, and there is this constant speaking and talking about suffering in the New Testament. And how do we, how do we interpret that? How are we supposed to understand that or comprehend that? How do you interpret that? Let me ask you more directly, how do you suffer with Christ? If I asked you tonight, just in conversation one-on-one, -on -one, and I said, hey, how you doing? How'd you suffer with Christ this week? What would you say to me? If you asked me that question, I would get very uncomfortable. And I would say, you know what? I, I had a pretty comfortable week, actually. Um, there probably were opportunities that I missed. There probably were things I could have done for other people that I didn't do. There probably were things that I could have suffered through that I, for my own comfort and own security, didn't. And there, was this, there would be an awkwardness and a kind of... Uh, just pain in, in, in that conversation. But here's, here's where I'm going to go with this. And here's just the simple outline. We're in, this is the first verse. But we're just going to look at a few ways to suffer. And there are probably more. And then we're going to finish up with the, where this section of Romans goes and see why this is so significant. Why this is so important to the Christian worldview, Christian experience, to the, really the Christian effort in our world. The, the, how important our effort in suffering is. Because it's easy if we're smart, which all of us are, I think, smart enough to avoid suffering. Because that's the first kind of smarts that people learn. Kids learn it. Animals learn it. We all learn it. It's easy. We, and and we, it's so instinctual and so innate that a lot of times we don't even realize what we're doing. We don't even realize that I'm building my life around and apart from anything that will cause me to feel discomfort, pain, or any kind of suffering. And here's the goal. And here's what I want. Here's what I, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was thinking about this lesson. What if we ended each day asking ourselves that question? How did I suffer today for Christ? Like, what if that's kind of the lens for just a month, just a week that we looked through our day through? You know, every day at the end of Nehemiah's day, you know what he would pray? He would pray something like this to God. After suffering through so many difficulties, suffering through like Saturday morning cartoon villains constantly trying to harass him and through people who just wouldn't listen to him and through efforts that just didn't seem to be working, you know what Nehemiah would get down on his knees at night and pray? God, please bless the work of my hands. You know, it didn't seem like it was going to work. It didn't seem like these things could ever come to fruition. But you know what happened? They built the wall back in, in an amazing time. 
And the things that God blessed, in the moment it seemed like, what is the purpose? What's the significance of this? And God used it. And what if we prayed a similar prayer, prayed a similar idea at the end of every day and said, man, <laughs> prayed to God and said, how, how can I suffer for you tomorrow? How, bless the effort I had today in, in trying to suffer with your son because I want to be a part of what he's about. And I think these ideals will get clear, more, maybe more clear as you look at some of these ways to suffer. But the bulk of this, this tonight will be just be looking at some ways to suffer. These are just ways I thought of, and there's, it's a simple idea. But I hope that maybe some of these get you thinking, get you uh, cogitating, as you might say, on some of the ways in your life that you might engage in this idea of suffering with and for Christ. So think about this. Here are the ways we're going to look at tonight, and then we'll get into the first one. There are, suffering, there are suffering that comes incidental to existence, and it seems like, you know, we'll talk about that. There is suffering against sin. There is suffering through shame or embarrassment, suffering pain. And then there's a few ways we suffer in our relationships. We might suffer want in our relationships, that we have less than we, than we would like or less than we might even feel like we need for the benefit of others. There is suffering that we do directly for others, and there's suffering we do alongside others in our relationships. This is not comprehensive. This is not a perfect list. But this is a list that I put together as ways that I thought we could interact with suffering that I thought the Bible speaks to. So let's look at this first. Suffering that's incidental to existence. This is a pretty depressing uh, catch-all. But I wanted to start here because there is suffering that comes in this life just because we exist. Ecclesiastes talks about how the race isn't always to the swift nor the battle to the strong, but time and chance happen to all. And there is just a, a sense in this, in this sad and broken world where all of us are going to be faced with difficulty and suffering. And I don't mean this in a trite way. You don't have to look farther than the headlines in the past month to see how true this is. This world is broken. And people are broken. And broken and hurt people tend to exert their brokenness and their hurt on the world around them. And then sometimes, and a lot of times, whether it happens to us directly or indirectly, we feel the brokenness of this world, and it hurts, and it causes us to suffer. Look at this psalm in Psalm 34. It's just a little segment, but as David writes, he says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Listen, first of all, here's a question for this psalm. Do you, do you believe this? Do you believe this is how God is? Do you believe, have you experienced this? Or do you, do you have faith that this is who God is, that this is what he's like? And secondly, what is this psalm saying about God and his maybe desire and his relationship with us when we are going through difficult things? Even when just the incidental suffering happens, or maybe just the suffering that comes along with being righteous, like this psalm talks about. But if you're brokenhearted, or if you feel crushed in spirit, what's God's desire? I'll tell you, I think one of the things that we have to really understand about suffering in general, before we get into this concept about suffering more specifically, is that whatever pain we go through, God wants to be involved in it. And that's, that's a weird idea, I think. And maybe it's not to you, but I, I want to put this forth that God wants to be involved in our suffering because God wants to be involved in all of our lives. And that's what the Psalms paint. Well, there's so many difficult and sad and, and just heart-wrenching Psalms because these faithful people understood that God wanted to be involved in our lives in good times and in bad. But sometimes what happens with people is that we get puffed up and we think, you know, maybe this is just me projecting onto the whole world, but this is something that I struggle with, I'll be honest. That when things get hard, or when I feel down, or when I feel depressed, or when I feel just empty, when I feel overexerted, I tend to isolate myself because I don't want to burden anybody else with that. I don't want anybody else to, have to deal with my, my garbage in my life, or my pain, or my suffering. I don't want anybody else, let, and not even God, I don't, want to, I don't want to embarrassingly come to God again and tell him how hard my life feels to me. I don't want to feel dramatic like that. I don't want to feel like I'm just constantly this needy individual. I don't like being reminded of that. So you know what I do? Instead of praying like this prayer, I bottle it all up. Maybe that's a classic masculine experience. I don't know. Maybe it's just a classic human experience. But I want to tell you this. That, that I want you to hear this. That this idea of suffering first has to be put into our brains and put into our hearts to, to let us know that God wants to be involved in our suffering. And what that means is that he wants to be close to us even when we don't feel like anybody should be close to us. 
or like anybody would want to be close to me right now. If I'm so useless and so broken and so much in pain, so crushed in spirit, so afflicted, why would anybody want to be around me? But God in his great compassion and loving kindness wants to be close to us, maybe especially in our difficulties, so that we will know how great and loving he is. And so just, first of all, in this idea, I don't, I, I, this has to be first because this can be a really depressing lesson if, if we don't understand that even in our suffering, God wants to be very close to us, have a close relationship with us. One of the first ways I think Christians have to wrap our arms around suffering is that to, to stop sinning in our, on, our, on our side, it feels like suffering. Look at this verse in 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4 says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. You see, did you catch this first part? You know, a lot of times we hear about maybe arming ourselves for the purpose of Christ. We don't think about arming ourselves maybe the purpose of suffering. And if we do, it's not necessarily an obvious connection that arming ourselves with the purpose of suffering will be arming ourselves with the purpose to cease sinning. Have you ever made that connection? But if you think about it, and especially for those of you who've been Christians for a long time, maybe you can remember this. Maybe you can reflect back on the moments when you gave your life to Christ and the pain you went through to put away sinful behaviors from your life. The pain you went through, the, the cutting off from different people and relationships that weren't maybe good for you at the time, or just the ways that you had to go to make sure that you didn't fall into the same traps that you fell into in this world. Was that fun for you? It hurts. But here's, I think, a lie that Satan wants to tell Christians. It tells the Christian world in general that becoming a Christian and the walk of a disciple, it's easy. And once we have the Holy Spirit, that everything kind of becomes a cakewalk. And, and don't get me, get me wrong, the Holy Spirit empowers us and, and gives us victory in Christ. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't come at a cost for us. Sorry for the double negative. It comes at a cost. Getting sin and rooting it out of our lives, especially when it is the ways that we've coped and the things that have brought us joy or, or satisfaction or happiness more accurately in the moment when we felt no, none of that, when we felt pushed out by the world. Sometimes these sinful behaviors are what we've learned to feel some amount of good in this world. And if that's where we're at, if that's where you're at, then this idea of being able to, to not sin, to be able to, to put these things, these attitudes, these behaviors, some of these things maybe on this list even, to put these away, it hurts. Because our good and our relationships, our closest friendships, the best times, the greatest memories we have are associated with them. Are you willing to suffer through that? Listen, some, some of us, we are willing to suffer through and we've grown in some ways, but then there's just one corner of our life, one corner of our existence where we're not willing to suffer through the pain we know it'll take to get rid of that. We're like Rachel bringing along the household idol, uh, idols, or we're like Achan burying the treasure under our tent. We just try and hide it away and keep it for ourselves. But if you're looking for a way to suffer... So you can suffer with Christ. This is a good place to start. And here's what, this connects it to the next idea, actually. And in, in this process, as you do this, the people around will be surprised. The people from your past life, the people you used to run with, will be surprised that you don't run with them in the same excesses of dissipation. And what will they do? A lot of times they might malign you. That's not easy either. Listen, Nowhere does God say that this process of, of disentangling or, or separating from the world is going to be a, an, an easy walk down in the park. It's going to be painful. And some of us just need to hear that bitter pill so that we can get it into our brains that this is going to be something I'm going to put effort in. I'm going to walk through that pain no matter how much it hurts because I need to get, I need to be closer to God than I am now. I need to love him more with my whole heart. So there's suffering against sin. The next one is suffering through shame and embarrassment. And this one, a lot of these dovetail, shame and embarrassment, some, to some degree, over, overlap or dovetail with the next one. But I want you to think about this. When Paul wrote 2 Timothy, he was writing to a preacher who he left at a very difficult church, and it seemed like at this point in 2 Timothy that 
Timothy was kind of, he was growing timid. He was growing, kind of, his, 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 his fervor was growing cold. Paul tells him to rekindle the gifts that were given to him. It seems like Timothy was kind of a shell of himself to some degree. Maybe that's too dramatic, but this seems to be the idea. And so when Paul writes to him in 2 Timothy verse 1 and 7, he says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and of self-control or discipline. And then he says this in 2 Timothy 1.8. He says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Do you see maybe, why do you think Paul had to write this first sentence? Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Now, again, it's it's a dangerous practice to read into the text. But I think this one seems at least a little clear that we can extrapolate the Timothy. Part of Timothy's struggle was that he was starting to become ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, Right? And maybe even a shame that his teacher, the guy he was most associated with, that Paul was in prison, and maybe just maybe this young guy started to start to doubt, is this the path I want to take? If that's where it leads, if 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 my model for my job, my occupation is Paul, and he's in prison and on the death's doorstep because of this, is this really the path I want to take? Think about that. And think about all the derision that people could have thrown his way. Look, Timothy, Paul, you know, your your father in the faith, the guy you look up to, look where it got him. Are you sure this is the job you want to do? Are you sure you're cut out for that, Timothy? Think about all the things he could have said, at least in his internal monologue. And Paul writes to him and says, look, I know where you're at, but this is the reason I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed because all that stuff in the middle, all the beautiful language about Christ abolishing death and bringing life and immortality to light through the gospel and the, the grace and the granting, the holy calling they were given. Paul says, that's why I suffer through this. I suffer through the shame. I suffer through the embarrassment of going from one prison cell to another, of being with one prison guard to the next and everyone looking down on me. I suffer through this shame because it's a holy calling we've been given. You see, this is one of the ones I think that maybe pricks our lives the most often. When we talk about suffering as Christians, we're like, well, there are places like China and the Middle East maybe where Christians might actually be killed or imprisoned, and we're not going through that. And so we kind of belittle the idea of suffering. But we know there's an element of suffering, which is just embarrassing, right? That hurts. That hits us in our hearts, especially with our closest relationships, our coworkers, or our neighbors, the people that, we've, that we just love being around, that we care what they think about us. And so we don't want them to, be, to shame us. We don't, want them to be, we don't want to be embarrassed in front of them because we believe this gospel. But one of the ways that we can suffer with Christ is what Paul talks about right here, this holy calling, the grace, the purpose and grace, God's purpose and grace, which was granted to us. Do you think about that? That's such a beautiful idea that that his, it's not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus and been revealed to us. This is what our calling is. But the, the difficult thing is, I know this is an obvious point, but it's one worth considering. If you're looking for a way to suffer with Christ this week, then think about all the embarrassment that you avoid because you don't want people to think you're believing in some hokey religion. You don't want people to know how seriously you take your faith. So you kind of hedge around the words, hedge around the ideas. You don't really tell people exactly how, you know, what your faith looks like or how important it is to you. If you're looking for a way to suffer this week, suffer through confidently sharing. Some of us, it might be real difficult. I struggle with this too. I mean, I go to the same coffee shop all the time and I'm still, and a lot of the baristas there are, are Christians. And I still like get awkward to talk about my faith sometimes. Listen, this is an area where we can lean into suffering with Christ, for Christ. What about pain? Listen, I know maybe this might not apply to us right now or apply to us soon. Who knows? It applies to some Christians somewhere, I'm sure, because it always has. 
But look what the Hebrew writer wrote to these Christians. Hebrews 12, verse 4. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Listen, this verse is just important in general when we think about suffering. Because while we may not suffer to the point of shedding blood, which this verse is just one of the most crazy verses in the New Testament to me. That this was written to Christians saying, look, you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood. Like, what are you, what are you whining about? That, that almost reads like that to me. I know it's not what it says. And that's not what it's saying. But there is an assumption here saying, look, like Christ suffered to the point of shedding blood. Many of the apostles have suffered to the point of shedding blood. You're not there yet. What are you scared of? And this is a hard verse. This is a hard saying. But then it gets into all this business. In general, when we think about suffering, these are important lessons. That, that suffering is part of God's discipline. This idea of God disciplining us because he cares about us, because he wants us to know. But, but most importantly, God disciplines us for our good so that what? There in yellow. What, why does he do it? He wants us to share in his holiness. Hebrews talks a lot about sanctification. We talked about that last week. And this idea of sharing in God's holiness is the same concept that we could be like him. You see, so often our, in our avoidance of pain and any discomfort in this life, we miss the point that God is calling us to be with him, to be like him, to walk in the paths that he himself walked in. And he says, come on, you could be just like me. And we take the first step and it, it hurts a little bit. We take the first step and it's not as comfortable as our couch. It's not as comfortable as the zone we live our entire lives in. We're like, whoa, I wasn't, I didn't sign up for this when I became a Christian. You see, this idea of suffering, it's not just the idea of linked to our being heirs with Christ, but it's also the idea of this is how God, this is how God causes growth in his children. And for those of us, those of you maybe, but then anyone listening or for any Christian at any point, when we suffer to the point of actually enduring physical pain, like some, like many have in history and many do maybe today, this encouragement stands for, the, for, for them, for us, that when that pain comes, we can, we can remember with joy in our hearts, even through the pain, that God is for us. And that God is doing something through us in that moment. So we can suffer just because of the existence. We can suffer against sin. We can suffer shame and embarrassment. We can suffer pain. And then there's a lot of suffering in our relationships. And these are all opportunities. Listen, it's easy to not suffer in any relationship, isn't it? It's easy to just be friends with the people that benefit you and to be in relationships with people because they make you feel better, they make you feel cooler, they make you feel accepted. And that's really great. It's important, actually, to have friendships like that. But if we're not careful, all of our relationships, all of our friendships, every relationship we have on this earth is just all about me and making me feel like a better, like my life is more balanced like I want it to be. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But listen to this. If we never feel like we're giving, if we never feel like maybe I'm giving a little too much, if we never feel this, this strain or pull of, and I'm not trying to lay too many burdens on any of us, but all I'm saying is sometimes we might need to feel a little more want I need to feel a little more impinged upon by the people around us because we're willing to give. And the first example I think of is in Acts. I mean, do you think it was easy for Barnabas, Joseph, to sell a whole property and give all the proceeds to the apostles? Do you think he felt at all like, mm, I had plans for this. Mm, I could have done this. I could have done this. With I could have bought this. I could have gone here. I could have traveled there. I, could have, I had plans for what I was going to do with this money. Do you think it ever, that, that ever crossed his mind through that process? I bet you it did. You see, sometimes when we don't, we look around at people around us, we're like, well, yeah, I know that the, you need stuff, but I also need stuff. And this is how John puts it in 1 John 3. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we lo love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. 
Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Listen, if this is how we actually love, that I never told you I loved you, but I lived my whole life so that every action I took, you knew I loved you. Everything I did, every way that I acted, every sacrifice I made, it implied and it exhibited the fact that I care about you more than I care about my very life. See, that's, what, that's the extreme measure of love that John's calling to. And do you think that ever feels like pain? Do you think it ever feels like suffering? Do you think it ever demands that you get up from the couch, get up from your comfort zone, and, and go outside in ways that you don't want to at the moment? Listen, if you're looking for a way to suffer, suffering want for the people around you, suffering a little more want than you suffer now, is a way you can suffer with Christ. And this is, direct, is related. It's, uh, these all dovetail, all three of these. This idea of suffering for others. And this is kind of, I mean, this is like a catch-all, I suppose. But look at this verse in Colossians 1. This is a verse I, I think I talk about probably too much, but I, it just sticks with me. Colossians 1.24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefits so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for, those, for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged. Having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Listen, Paul's perspective on why he did what he did, why he went through his life, he said, look, I rejoice in my suffering, the pain I go through, I go through it for who? For all of you, for the people in the churches, for the people who hadn't even met him yet. And he talks about it in this sense. He's like, look, this is a great struggle. I struggle through this for your sake, for your behalf, because I want you to know something. You see, Paul was willing to suffer anything and everything in this life that this life could throw at him so that people might just be encouraged. Do you see that up there? All those who have not personally seen my face, I do all this, I struggle and I suffer so that their hearts might just be encouraged. What's, let me ask you, what's the, what's the most you've went through so that someone might just feel a little encouragement in their day? And that's not what Paul, exactly what Paul's talking about. That's the idea here, that there might be someone who has a greater understanding of who Christ is through your pain, through my pain. And then lastly, just this idea, maybe the most simple of all of these, but sometimes the hardest to do, is that we would suffer alongside others. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. When you're going through good times, is it easy to come alongside someone who's suffering, who seems to be suffering for a long time, and to really come alongside and, and pick them up and to be with them, to be with them in their pain, to weep and cry with them? And sometimes it's even harder to rejoice with those who are in joyful times when you're going through the deepest, darkest times of your life. But this is the beauty of the church, that we would be the kind of people who suffer alongside with the people around us. There's a lot of those. I know I went through a lot, maybe too many. But I wanted to give you maybe an equipping. If you, if you have this question of, okay, I know I need to suffer with Christ. I know I might need to suffer for Christ. But if you've never... Maybe you haven't thought about some of these ways that you can actually engage in this. I hope that those seven ways will be a benefit to you. Because here is what is at stake. Here's what is going on. Here's the encouraging thoughts that we all want to end on. This isn't 14 through 17. This is 18 through um, later in Romans 8. But he says, For I consider... That the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. 
For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Do you see what he's saying here? After he tells us that we're fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, he then says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. If we suffer with Christ, we will be glorified with Christ. But here he says, look, this glory that's coming is so out of comparison. It's so far greater than the suffering we're going to face here. You can't even comprehend it. can't even be compared. This weight of glory, as it said in 2 Corinthians, this weight of glory that's going to be revealed to us. And then he tells us something that we ought to know, that we do know, but that we blind ourselves to, that the anxious longing of the whole creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. All the stuff that's going on, all the futility, all the pain, all the brokenness of this world, it's a part of what God's done. Not because he wanted it to be suffering, but because he wanted it because he had hope that through all this, creation will be set free. Why am I talking about all this with anything we're talking about tonight? Listen, we know that this world is broken. And Christians know this world is broken, and we know the reasons, we know what's going on more than, uh, supposedly, more than a lot of people. We know the spiritual truths going on behind the physical consequences. But when we aren't willing to suffer with Christ and suffer through some of our own discomfort and pain for the other people's sakes, they're not going to know that. This world doesn't understand The world at large doesn't appreciate the spiritual truths going on that Christ has told us. And if we really believe that, if we really have the faith and the trust to to see that as true, then we got to wrap our arms around the idea that it's going to be painful to communicate it. It's going to be painful to to interact with a world that is broken and wrapped up in in sin and, and in selfishness and the failures that come with this world. But this is all based out of the hope we have in our salvation. The hope that what's waiting for us, like the song that that Todd led us in earlier, what's waiting for us is way greater than any suffering we face here. Listen, this is like a basic Christian idea, and I I get that. Um, I wanted to think about this and look at this because suffering is just an idea that we don't like to talk about. We don't want it to be a part of our Christianity, but I want you to see that, that if we could just think every day, how could I suffer maybe for Christ today? How could I suffer for the people around me a little bit today so that they could understand the freedom and the glory and the hope that is in Jesus Christ? And if we can suffer a little more pain, a little more embarrassment, a little more discomfort, a little more want, and a little more for, the, for other people's sakes, a little more just pain in this world. If we could suffer a little more, then maybe people would see that like we see it. That's the goal. Listen, if we can help you, if you're suffering, if you're in pain, part of what Christians do and part of our mission is to help people who are feeling that. If we can be of any help to you, if we can pray with you, if we can comfort you, If you want to be baptized, if you want to build a close relationship with Christ, if there's any way we can help you with your spiritual needs especially, please make it known as we stand and sing this final song.
standing, and Mitchell will lead us in our closing prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful to be your children, and we're so thankful to be able to approach your humble throne, humbly before your throne, and we're so thankful that you sent your son to die for our sins. We're so thankful for this uh, uh, group of brothers and sisters that we have here that help us and help as we help each other to um, endure the suffering of this life and help us as we encourage others and spread the gospel. Dear Father, we're so thankful for uh, Ben and Brent and the work that they do to evangelize and to teach. We're so thankful for their efforts. We're so thankful for our elders, for Brad, for Lyle, for Mark, for Todd. We're so thankful for them and all the work they do and the countless hours they put in to uh, serve the flock here. We ask that you be with them and give them an extra portion of strength and patience as they deal with us and all of the issues that we have, because mostly because of the cares of this world, dear Father. Help us to remember that we are just uh, travelers in this world and that our, our real home and our real residence is with you in heaven and that this is just a temporary thing that we have here. Dear Father, help us to remember that and to think on things above and to not be surrounded by the things of this world. Help us not to let those, uh, the evil of this world invade our, our thoughts and our actions. Help us to uh, reach out to our brothers and sisters as they struggle with the cares of this world and the, their, their health and their physical well-being. We ask that you uh, uh, be with our brothers and sisters who are struggling with their physical well-being. People are struggling with uh, COVID, who are struggling with cancer, with loss, with other forms of pain and suffering. Dear Father, we know that our prayers are, are heard and we know that not only are they heard, but you action our prayers for you've done so much for our brothers and sisters here, and we're so thankful to hear that our brother Larry was able to go home from the hospital. We ask that you strengthen him as he recovers. We ask that you be with all of those who've recently been afflicted with COVID and let it be that they can make a full recovery and not uh, face the after effects that, that some are suffering with. And dear Father, we are so bold as to ask that you just lift this COVID pandemic from us and, and, and just take it away. We know it's within your power, dear Father, but we know all things, we ask these things in, in your uh, will and not our will be done, but yours. Dear Father, we're, we don't understand all of the things that are happening in the world and we don't understand the evil that, that occurs. Dear Father, help us and give us patience and strength as we deal with that. Help us again to rally upon you and, and your word and to uh, focus our efforts to spread the gospel and the love and compassion of Christ Jesus so that others can feel the relief of sin and pain that, that we feel through your son. Dear Father, we also ask that if it be your will that you uh, end this war just, just immediately in, in uh, the Ukraine, just please, dear Father, protect those innocent people who are suffering and and moreover, all of those people who are suffering with the threat of violence, and uh, we ask that you uh, 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 protect them. For, dear Father, we know that there is so much evil in this world that has been uh, just uh, expanded because of Satan and his, uh, uh, the evil think thoughts that he places in people. We ask that you just, just take that away and, uh, and uh, end this war. Dear Father, we ask that you give others other Christians around the world the same blessings that you've given us in, in peace and safety. And we ask that you uh, strengthen them as you strengthen us as well. And be with those uh, soldiers of Christ who are in the mission fields and working in difficult conditions and places where there are not the brothers and sisters to strengthen them. We ask that you uh, give them an extra portion of boldness to, to spread your gospel. Dear Father, as we leave this place, help us to uh, uh, think on you and, and um, our walk in Christ and not upon the cares of this world until we can come back and be together with uh, your saints and study your word again and encourage one another in Christ Jesus. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.